What do you like to talk about? I could say, tell me a Seinfeld story. I could say, tell me what it was like doing Borat. Well, I like, ta- I like talking I mean, about this. I like whatever. To me, this conversation is this conversation. Whatever yeah. you want to talk about, I'm happy to talk about. I could tell you Borat stories. I could tell you Seinfeld <laughs> stories. I have stories about all those things. I have great Bob Dylan stories. Yeah, tell me you a know. Bobby D story because I know nothing about it. All right. Him. Very, I was just thinking about this morning. Uh, um, originally, Bob was interested I got a call that he was interested in doing he had been on the road he's on this endless tour yeah he's on this tour all the time he lives on a bus really most of the time interesting and he's got a TV this is back in the in the in the uh, 90s he's got a TV in the bus and he watches movies and he gets into certain genres of movies and he gets like addicted to them and just watches every single one of them yeah and he had been watching Jerry Lewis movies <laughs> and he had gotten deeply into Jerry Lewis and he wanted to make a slapstick comedy. <laughs> no way. Yes. And Bob Dylan's the kind of guy, again, learned a lot from him. And he was like, he just trusts his instincts. No matter how crazy it might seem to anybody else, yeah. he does what he thinks. He, that's what he wants to do. Right. He doesn't think about the consequences of it. So he wants it's what to, he has to do, going that's back what, to what That's what he, what he has it's to like do. Exactly. I, I've received the golden phone call so and I have to make exactly. a Exactly. So movie. suddenly now he's obsessed with, with a slapstick comedy like a Jerry Lewis thing and he wants to do it as a TV series for HBO. So I'm called in to meet with him. From executive producer Bob Dylan? And then somebody gets no, hit with a two by four? No, he's in it. He would be in it. Yes, he'd be the star of it. He wanted to star in it. Like you, almost like a Buster Keaton or something, you know? That's a lot of bus movie time right there. Really? It crazy. seems like a yes. dream sequence. Yes. Well, the, the whole experience is very dreamlike. <laughs> yeah. So I go to meet with him. And in my mind, I'm going like, I'm meeting Bob Dylan. This is fantastic. I'm going to have one meeting with Bob Dylan. Yeah. Nothing's going to come of it. I could tell all my friends I met Bob Dylan. Yeah. And that's all I'm really looking to accomplish from this. Yeah. Is have a story mm-hmm. to tell about Bob Dylan. I go see him. <laughs> He owns a boxing gym in Santa Monica. I meet him in the back of the boxing gym in a cubicle. He's chain smoking the whole time. The cubicle's completely, like if you've ever been in one of those airports with a little smoking kiosk, it's like that. It's just completely (laughs) smoke filled. He says to me, um, his assistant comes over and goes, you guys want something to drink? And and it's it's attached to this coffee house. So so I say, yeah, I'll I'll just have a nice coffee. And he goes, I want something hot. I want a hot beverage. (laughs) I want a hot beverage because that's sort of how he talks. He talks in this very ornate way. And <laughs> so they bring a hot coffee for him, like a cappuccino or something. They bring the iced coffee for me and they put it to get, they put them together in the middle of the table and he immediately grabs my iced coffee and starts drinking the iced coffee. <laughs> and I'm watching him drink it and I'm not touching the other thing. I didn't want the other thing. And finally he almost finishes my drink and he goes, well, why aren't you drinking your drink? It's like, you're drinking my drink, you know? And he, <laughs> he, he, he kind of laughed. He laughed, and that kind of broke the ice. No. Strangely enough. And then he took out this ornate. This is like, it's like a going to see a sorcerer. Because <laughs> it's like all a test. Like, like, he drank my drink. How would I react? That's right. Like Lorne Michaels almost. <laughs> yes. He brings out, yeah, uh, yeah, Lorne Michaels is a different case. Um, he brings out this very ornate, beautiful box, like a sorcerer would. <laughs> And he o- he opens the box. He opens the box and dumps all these pieces of scrap paper on the table, and they're all like, again like a sorcerer. Like a sorcerer. It's like <laughs> is he going to conjure something and make? And, and and yes, that is what he. That's exactly what he does. He, every piece of scrap paper was from a, it was a hotel, hotel stationery. Little scraps like from Norway and from you know Belgium and Brazil and places like that. And each little piece of paper had a line. Like some kind of little line scribbled or a name scribbled, Uncle Sweetheart, mm. or a weird poetic line or an idea or whatever. And he's like, he's like, I don't know what to do with all this. <laughs> and I'm like, well, you know, you could t- for some reason, I was able to go, you know, you could take this. This is a line and this is the character. And then this character could say this line. He said, you could do that? And it's like, yeah, yeah, you could do that. He's like, because I realized that's how he writes songs. He takes these scraps and he puts them together. And makes makes his poetry out of that, you know. No. Yeah, he has all these ideas, and then just in a kind of a subconscious or unconscious way, he lets them kind of synthesize hmm. into a coherent thing, hmm. and that's how we wound up writing. Also, <laughs> we wound up writing in a very uh, like cut up technique. We would just take scraps of paper, put them together, try to make them make sense, try to find the story points within it. And we finally wrote, we wrote like a very elaborate treatment for this slapstick comedy, which is filled with surrealism and all kinds of things from his, from his songs and stuff. Wow. So we say to Bob, if we go to HBO, if you come to HBO with us, 
you will definitely will definitely sell the project because they won't have the balls to say no to you. Yeah. To your face. Yeah. And he agrees. That's so, great. So we, we go to this He HBO has awareness meeting. of his own ego. He's yes. like, you're right. If so I'm there. We go. That's right. He's, <laughs> he, he's, he, has a, he has incredible awareness. He knows he, bad Bob Dylan. He, yes. Oh, we'll he, send Bob even Dylan. Even if he puts a, a, a mask on. Yeah. Because I've seen people come up to him and say, oh, can I tell you? You're asking a question. You know, why did you go electric? And I've seen him just stare at them and not give them an answer. And then just walk away. <laughs> like he's okay with that level of discomfort. Oh my you know? god! That he could like you could ask him a question to his face. He could just stare at you and walk away and not feel compelled to go. I don't want to answer it. I don't remember. You know, sometimes look with me. He would say, "I don't remember." Right. That was another way he got out. Why did you go electric? I don't remember. I don't remember. <laughs> That's what he would say. He would say things like, "Why did you go electric?" <laughs> I was like, "Why did I go electric?" You know, I was like, "I love that culturally we still haven't replaced Dylan going electric." Yeah, it still yeah, gets it's still, It works. It works. <laughs> but, but he would often turn turn it on you. You know, why why did you go electric? Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, you know, he would ask these questions that would kind of come back and crack your mind. Over. Like, well, one time he said to me, uh, he said uh, he had a line about a pig <laughs> wearing a wig. And I said, Bob, I was comfortable enough to say, Bob, even in this thing, that doesn't make any sense. No one's going to understand that. And he said, what's so bad about misunderstanding? Uh-huh. It's like, wow, that was a heavy one because we are yeah. striving all the time to be understood. Yeah. He's been understood. He's more interested now in what happens when you're misunderstood. Well, he's like a comedian who only kills and now he just wants to go up and alienate Exactly. Yeah. He's like Andy Kaufman or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, you know, It was very, very kind of conceptual. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So we wrote this thing. We went to the <laughs> We went to the meeting. He showed up for the meeting. At that time, by the way, I was only wearing pajamas. Everywhere I went. Good for you. I used to just wear pajamas. <laughs> I had worked at Mad About You for two years. I started wearing pajamas. I just used to go to everywhere I went. My kids, I would take my kids to like events and I'd be wearing pajamas. <laughs> I, I probably was having a nervous breakdown. I didn't realize it, but I wore pajamas everywhere I went. <laughs> but I was comfortable doing it. I was so comfortable. It was great. It was great. <laughs> so I show up for the meeting in my pajamas. Bob? That is the only way to bring a gun to a gunfight. You're oh, going man. into Bob Dylan, and he's yeah. going to say pig in a wig, and, and you're like... Uh-uh. And speaking of a gunfight, he shows up for the meeting at HBO in, no. a, in a, black, a black cowboy hat, a black floor-length duster, black boots. He looks like, you know, Cat Baloo or something. Oh, my God. He looks like a Western guy who's carrying six guns, you know? <laughs> we stride down the hall at HBO, if you can imagine that scene. Yes. I'm, like, with my, my hair is, like, super long, beard, like, down <laughs> to my belly button in fucking pajamas. <laughs> and Bob Dylan's dressed like a cowboy from a movie. Yeah. We go into the meeting, and Chris Albrecht, who is the president of HBO, says, Bob, oh, so great to meet you. Look, look, I have the original tickets from Woodstock. And Bob goes... I didn't play Woodstock. And then he walks over to the other side of the office, which has floor-to-ceiling windows overlooking the city, and he proceeds to have his back turned to us through the entire meeting. No. He never turns around. I have to start pitching this, this thing. Because of the Woodstock comment? Yeah, he just was like, he was on, He was just, he, this is who he is. It's like Gavin Pallone, Gavin Pallone was there, who was uh-huh. my manager at the time. He was like, He's like a retarded child. You know, that's what, wow. that's what, it's like, but I, so I would go like, well, we, Bob is going to do this. Bob's Bob right, is a right, special Bob? needs yeah. child. And, and at the end, ironically, despite all the discomfort, they bought the project. No. Indeed. They bought the project. We go out to the elevator. Bob's manager, Jeff, my manager, Gavin, me and Bob, the three of us are elated. We actually sold the project. And Bob says, I don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> What? He says, I don't want to do it anymore. It's too slapsticky. He's like, not into it. That's over. The slapstick phase has officially ended. He saw a billboard when he was looking out that window He's for, not into for it. True Detective. Not into like- it anymore. And Gavin Pillow <laughs> said to me, you got to get out of this. And I'm like, look, I'm on the Bob Dylan train. I'm going to take this train wherever it takes me. <laughs> 